Hi puzzles and pieces, it's Jessica from Multiplicity and Me, a channel dedicated to ending the stigma of DID, otherwise known as Dissociative Identity Disorder. And we are exceptionally excited to be featuring our very first episode in our brand new Ask the Experts series. This is not only where we interview experts in the field, but also experts by experience. So people who have the experiences of having DID and then maybe something else that we're not akin to or we don't know enough about. When we started this journey, we never ever wanted our story to be the only one out there. Our goal was to be a drop of water in the very vast ocean of stories that people could tell and share about their experiences living with this disorder. And so we are heading back to our roots by doing exactly that and asking other people to share their stories and tell us some more. We are asking experts by profession or experts by experience to come and join us to help educate and end the stigma against the disorder because we're just a case study and we're interested in others lived realities and experiences with the condition. Our story is simply one of many and we are proudly presenting this project so we can give other people involved in this disorder a larger voice. Who knows where this series will be taking us? but I am so excited to be finding out and sharing this with you guys too. Today's very first expert is none other than Dr. Mike Lloyd. He is a consultant clinical psychologist specializing in trauma and dissociation. So much so in 2019, he set up the CTAD clinic, which is the third specialist clinic in the UK dealing with the assessment and treatment of dissociative disorders. What a great guy. Thanks, Dr. Lloyd. As Dr. Lloyd was our very first expert by profession and being our very first to introduce this series, we thought it would be sensible to not only cover the introductions of himself, but also the introductions of DID so we can have in black and white what DID is and what it's all about. We wanted to ask him for that DID 101. Hi, Mike. Thank you so much for helping to launch our Ask the Expert series today and being our very first speaker. Hi Jess, and thank you for having me, it's a pleasure. To kick us off, I'm curious about how you ended up in the field of DID? Um, completely accidentally. It literally came down to me needing more hours in a job that I wanted to get. So I'd been uh, in child and adolescent mental health services for quite a few years and wanted to move into adult. So I got a, sh a part-time adult post and they said, we have this lady who has something that we don't quite understand. Would you be interested in doing a specific piece of work to try and figure out how to help her get better, recover? So I just took it on and they gave me a day a week to work with this person and I ended up working with her for seven years. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, I'm rearing to go with so many questions to cover an introduction to DID. Are you ready? Yes, do your best. In your own words, can you describe what dissociative disorders are and how they occur? Probably the best way to think about dissociation from my point of view is that it's a disruption or a dislocation, a discontinuity of things that are supposed to happen. So if you think about normal life is doing the right thing in the right time in the right place. And if that works, you pretty much get what you're looking for. Dissociation is when it could either be something is taking place in the body that is not happening at the right time, it's not happening in the right place, or it's not happening in the right way. So it's that dislocation between what should happen and what is happening. The person walks into the park and they're walking their dog and they throw a stick and the dog catches the stick and they play around for an hour and they come home. That's what should happen. Right thing, right time, right place. Dissociation could be you walk into the park with your dog and the next thing you know, you're a mile and a half away and you're sitting in a crowded coffee shop with no idea how you got there with a coffee in front of you that you don't even want. So if that's an example of what a dissociation can be. It's that dislocation of time and place and reality and internal, internal understanding of what on earth might be happening for you. We think of it as a disorder when it's going on for the wrong reason. So that type of dislocation in the right time can be a very good thing. So if something really terrible is happening and you have that sort of discontinuity of reality and that protects you and moves you away from the really terrible thing, it's a disorder if they're walking through a shopping center and someone sneezes behind them or someone drops uh, a pint glass in a pub and the next thing they know they're at home and it, there's no reason for it. So that's where we think of the disorder. What are the main symptoms of DID and how would a client present? 
the, the key characteristics, if you think of DID as opposed to other types of dissociation, is the altered identity. So within the diagnostic criteria, you have to have the presence of more than one identity that has its own way of functioning, its own behavior, its own mannerisms, potentially its own history, it may or may not have ages, genders, all of those sorts of things. So what we're looking for when we're thinking about the difference between DID and any other form of dissociation is a sense that you're dealing with more than one person who is capable of taking control of the body, taking control of mannerisms and act in a different way. There only needs to be one other. So the criteria is one or more. So the person that you're having the, the observation, having the interview with and one other part. So some people have dozens, some people have hundreds, some people say they have thousands. You only need one other. That is essentially what we look for. Is there a difference between high functioning and lower functioning clients and what factors may cause a variation? I mean, I suppose it comes down to almost an infinite series of factors as to whether a person has had a specific type of traumatic experience, the nature of the protective factors around them. So that question would be applied to any mental health condition realistically. So you could argue the difference between high functioning and low functioning is whether a person, let's say someone with depression could be low functioning if they don't have their friends and family around them. So let's say at the time of this, COVID, a lot of people might be less functioning with depression and anxiety because they don't have their, their family, friends, resources, activities, hobbies, routines. So high functioning people can actually deal with huge amounts of mental health problems because they're well surrounded by what we call protective factors. If you have a problem with substances or with self-harm or with eating, if those are unregulated and there's no systems or services or people around helping, the likelihood is you'll move into that lower functioning territory. The difference is more about the factors external to the person as much as, let's say, intensity of trauma because the person can be really low functioning but not have had what might some might consider to be huge trauma it's just the nature of the, their how they are in the world i guess everyone's different right everyone's, everyone's different unique. Yeah, and it could change from one day to the next. So I know very high functioning people that get into the winter and become low functioning because they have seasonal affective disorder and the, the absence of good quality daylight and those sort of things really makes a difference for them. I guess this is a million dollar question as well, is how much trauma does someone need to have DID? Well, yeah, precisely. They're, that's the whole length of string question. It's not necessarily what the trauma is. It's the nature of the... Um, the attachments within that trauma that are most specific to stuff like dissociation, especially DID. The person, I knew you could put like a one of the, a kid in a town in Syria that is experiencing mortar attacks, explosions and death of relatives on a daily and weekly basis might not have DID. And yet a person who lives in a leafy suburb in Surrey, who has hypercritical parents and a lack of emotional expression with their family might end up with DID. So you totally different parallels. Again, protective factors, the, the presence of strong uh, positive influences on that person's life, I think would make a, a real difference. I think the, the mistake is to, to backtrack with assumptions, to see a person with DID and automatically assume they must have had some vast trauma and then imagine in your mind all the sort of physical, sexual, emotional abuse and neglect that might be going on. But that might not be the case at all. And, and a person might not think that they've had a great deal of trauma, but they still have DID because it's the timing of that within the brain's development. It's the nature of the, the influences and the factors around them. You have to look at each and every case individually and realize that one person's trauma is not another person's trauma. Two people sit next to each other on a roller coaster. One is traumatized by the experience and never goes back. And the other person jumps in the queue and goes for it straight again. So individual factors apply. What advice would you give a professional, say somebody who is new to discovering DID and who has a client, what kind of tip top advice would you give them? Okay, um, I mean, this is part of my training. So when I do, I do lots of uh, half day, full day workshops, things like that. And that's a real important question because a lot of people say, well, if I'm going through this workshop today, am I gonna be ready to see someone with complex dissociation tomorrow, let's say? Or they might come on the workshop because they've got a client who they think has DID and they want to know more about it. So I think, and, and I can't really say, go on loads of training courses, get a qualification like a doctorate, and then you're ready to do it. Because I started working with dissociation without 
really any background knowledge whatsoever other than you know a couple of books to read i think the important thing is to approach any person with respect and belief so whether they've got um dissociative amnesia derealization or dissociative identity disorder you just start with them with respect and you are in a partnership with them this is about listening and believing more than anything else you can pick up so much knowledge along the way online training face-to-face -face training conferences but all that stuff is all out there and there isn't a specific qualification you need but i think you have to be supported in your work so i think you could get started with someone just by saying let's try and work out what's going on and have good supervision so that as you're going through the process of that work, the initial stages, you can link into a supervisor who's much more knowledgeable about dissociation and start learning as you go. I think if you've got the right intent and you never think that you know everything, you'll do okay. Um, I was gonna say, do you have any kind of like definite do's and definite don'ts as well for working with people with DID? Yeah, the definite don't is to think that trauma is the key to start. I think when you're doing, let's say, um, trauma-focused cognitive behavioural therapy, CBT, you tend to go at the trauma. Or if you're using EMDR, the eye movement desensitisation, you go to the trauma as fast as you can almost. You're, like, you're trying to hunt the trauma. With DID work, I basically say to any person I start with, we're putting trauma on the shelf. Whatever the experience was that got this DID system up and running, we leave for the time being. We acknowledge that it's there, but absolutely don't start hunting around and trying to look for it. You go straight into stabilization mode and you learn about that person, you build a relationship. So the big mistake is going going to trauma too early. I mean, I guess on that, you know, and the believability of a client, I guess mm. there are times where this disorder may be mimicked. Are there yes. any kind of telltale signs or reasons for doing so? Well, I mean, there's a whole, there's an actual um, uh, a, a disorder, if you like, called Ganser's syndrome, which is the, it's part of the line of factitious disorders. There are many, many types of, presentation that a person can bring to the to a, a clinical interview or a clinical assessment where it's factitious it could be that they think they have something that they don't or they're get or they're putting a a disorder forward for secondary gain so i had a conversation with a psychiatrist in a training event who's saying who's trying to look at people making did up because it's fashionable and i was saying well there's probably no more numbers of people making DID up as there are making up depression or anxiety or OCD or autism because some people genuinely think they have these conditions. I, I think we have to see um, fabrication or making a disorder up not in the context of DID. We've got to see it in the context of human experience. People make stuff up and lie all the time. Is there a clear difference between DID and OSDD? You have a sense that there is dissociation going on in lots of different ways, but there isn't anything specific enough to draw a concrete diagnosis. So I would say it's like a working diagnosis. I think something is going on, but I'm not sure what. So let's say you've got unspecified dissociative disorder, and then we'll, we'll fill in the gaps as we go along. So you could just say, I have no idea whether there's enough criteria to diagnose dissociation. So why don't we just start working with each other and see what turns up? If you're in a position of having to do a formal diagnosis within a short space of time, so let's say in NHS settings, you've got an hour consult, you have to have a, have a diagnosis at the end of the hour. I think you're in trouble. Rushing a diagnosis that could sit with someone for the rest of their life just does not seem like a good idea. So I would be really reluctant to do that. I think caution has to come to the fore, really. What are alters or parts and how does that occur within DID? Good question. <laughs> that's that's the, 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 because that's the key characteristic, it's these other, other identities. So people call them all sorts of stuff. I think whether they're alters or parts or others or sort of interjections or ego states, there's a whole ton of different things that people can call them. You just ask, someone what they want to call them they are the embodiment of that dislocation so when i'm talking about dis dissociation being a uh, a disruption between two things what the alters do is they represent the nature of that disruption 
So in the structural dissociation theory, you have the apparent normal personality and the emotional personalities. The emotional personalities are those disruptions. So they could be disruptions in memory, they could be disruptions in emotion, in age, pretty much anything. So the alters, what, what they carry is the sense of the reason that that dislocation or that disruption took place. So some, some alters are certain ages because maybe that disruption happened at that time, or they have particular behavior characteristics because those are the behaviors that are needed to protect the individual. So you could have a part that is full of anger and full of rage because the person has been harmed and they were powerless and they needed to, that, that, that internal sense of rage about being hurt. Let's say if they're three, four years old, they can't really embody that rage at an adult. So that rage sits in the system, is disrupted and dislocated because it should not be there in that child. So then an alter is formed, if you like, a system in the, the threat response system of the brain where that anger is placed to be carried and, and picked up and figured out later on when it's, the brain is more developed. How should you work with those alters? Because I, you know, I, I hear, I guess, through the grapevine, some therapists say that you shouldn't work with an alter because that's encouraging mm -hmm. parts, yes. or um, some say that you should. But then yeah. there's concerns that that sort of, you know, does encourage this disorder, quote unquote. So I just kind of wanted your opinion on that. Yeah. I mean, you're you're absolutely right. There is there is a mixed um train of thought if you like so yeah some say ignore the alters and only work with the person because to work with the alters encourages them to be there the fact that they're there is a disorder therefore you make the person better by ignoring the alters other people do the opposite and they sort of put the person to one side and just work with the alters because they see that's where the dissociation and the trauma actually sit Surprise, surprise, it's going to be something in the middle. You work with what seems to make sense at the time. So I always welcome every single alter and every single part in the DID system when I start working with a person. I say, you're all welcome to come to the table, but I understand the ones that do and the ones that don't, and it's fine. It's about respecting and seeing that, seeing that person as being unique. There is no right, absolute way of what to do. If you read any sets of guidelines about how to work with DID, there isn't a this is what you should do with alters part in those guidelines. It's just not there because it's about your gut instinct as a therapist. If you think that there's an alter that's in the system that is really important and is of enormous influence, you've got to get to work with them. You've got to build an alliance. But if you've got an alter, let's say, that likes colouring in books because that's a fun activity and that actually calms and regulates the system, why would you want to bring that alter into every single therapy session and spend 45 minutes coloring with them? That doesn't, that wouldn't make any clinical sense. It's so the question has to be seen from a clinical viewpoint is what you're doing in that therapy room actually progressing that person's treatment? If you think you're just maintaining it because it's interesting, that's not really therapeutically useful for that person. You've got to have that sense in your head that. The, the reason I'm doing this in any minute of it, oh, in any minute of any hour <laughs> is to progress that person's therapy. So I have cats now wandering about. There are two jumping about the place. So <laughs> who's the black and white one again, Mike? Uh, this one, one? So this one's McFly. Oh, that one's McFly. And Spodrick is sitting on the windowsill. He's the one that's causing the trouble. How does switching occur and why would this happen? I suppose every question I'm going to answer could just say it depends. It's a bit of a it's a bit of a cop out. Switching should realistically occur when it, there's a trigger. So the person is maybe fairly well regulated. There's a change in the external environment, or there's a change in the thought pattern. So a person might suddenly have an intrusive experience of a past memory that can dysregulate their system, lead to a switch, lead to a, a sort of change in the threshold within the window of tolerance theory, and then the switch occurs. So that can happen really fast, like in sort of one thousand, you know, ten thousandths of a second is the speed that that can take place. So a person is this, and then suddenly they're that. And that's, that's a trigger switch, if you like. But at the same time, many people with DID say absolutely nothing was going on, and yet an alter came out, and I dissociated, and I was calm and quiet, watching TV, nothing happening, and boom, suddenly there's, they get, a bit jumbled up 
and then a dissociation happens. So that might be that a part is bored, has been watching a program they don't like. So if you've got, let's say, a child, you're watching, I don't know, you're watching Line of Duty, and you've got a child part that hasn't watched a cartoon in three days, they might just come out, boot you out of the way, and then click the channel over to watch some cartoons. Now, that's not a trigger switch. That's just that internal part with its own identity, its own way of functioning, its own behavior. It doesn't want to watch the show that you're watching and just changes it. One of the things that I really love about being a psychologist in this field is the detective work. That a person will come to me and they'll say, I dissociated yesterday and it was really odd and I don't know what happened. And I, so I start analyzing and prompt questioning and trying to figure out all the, the information, the context. And there's always something in there that you can find. That's why it's really important, I think, to have a therapist that knows what they're talking about. So it's not much use just shrugging your shoulders and going, I don't know what happened. Hey ho, let's move on. The, the, there's a logic to it. So whatever the reason is that, sh that switch occurs, there will be something. There'll be something logical that's happened. It could be a trauma-based thing or it could just be an interest-based thing. It could be a weather thing. It could be about you know the night suddenly getting darker or suddenly getting lighter might cause more or less switching. It's an infinite set of answers. The trick, the therapeutic trick, is to do that detective work and figure it out. Amazing. I've heard that as well as that the OD is a very logical disorder. So whether it's down to the the uh, formation of it, whether it's the alters, whether it's kind of everything, almost everything, almost everything has a reason behind yes. it, or at least that's what we should be looking for. Yeah, which makes sense, doesn't it? If you mm. if you think that dissociation occurred for a reason, so if someone is dissociating, it doesn't matter necessarily what the trauma is. We know that something did happen, whatever it might be. So therefore, if you've got dissociation because of a reason, when the dissociation shows itself, there's a reason. And that logic, that's why with first person plural and Pottergate Center, that's why we called our first video about dissociative disorders a logical way of being, because that just was the most logical thing to call it, because that's how we all viewed it. So the, the therapists, the clinicians, and the experts by experience, that was our agreement from the start, that there is a point to dissociation. It's not a totally random phenomenon that occurs for no reason. I love this question. Um, what would you say to the critics and skeptics of this disorder stating that cases are simply iatrogenic or a fad? It's just role play. What would yeah. you say to those people? I love, I, I kind of love having those conversations in a, in a way because you, you, you've got the opportunity of delivering a bit of a history lesson. When the, the thing about it's a fad, so much of that is a social media construct that so many people are coming on social media and talking about their DID, talking about the system. So people think, oh, it's suddenly it's a fad. Pierre Genet is known as the father of dissociation. So he wrote his doctoral thesis in 1889, which is considered to be the seminal work on trauma and dissociation in the field. So we're looking at that being like 130 odd years old. Pierre Genet was, was working at the same time as Freud. I don't hear anybody saying that psychoanalysis is a fad because it's been going on for over 100 years. Dissociation has been written about, researched and seen in clinical practice for over 100 years. It's not a fad. It's just that people are now having the confidence to come forward and talk about it more. Saying DID is a fad is like saying child abuse is a fad. 50 years ago, people discounted the notion of child abuse. Even Freud was talking about him thinking that it was fantasy. It wasn't really true. Up until the 1950s and 1960s, we weren't talking about child abuse as being a thing. You get into the 80s and the 90s, we now understand that this is actually a thing. It's not a fad. It's not new that people are coming forward and saying, I was abused as a child. It's just we've now got the environment where people are allowed to talk about the stuff that's happened to them. 20 years ago, if you went into a GP surgery and started talking about your, your signs, your symptoms, your presentation of DID, you would have been admi pretty much admitted to a psychiatric hospital and sedated. So no one said anything about it. Now you can go to a GP, talk about it. They could refer you to a clinic like mine or refer you to a local mental health team who will ideally sit and go, OK, tell me about yourself then. Not just jump to antipsychotics or a section. They actually sit and listen. So 
the fad isn't the construct of DID, it's just it's becoming much more easy and acceptable to talk about it. The other aspect about the therapist can somehow create it, that it's not a real thing in the first place, there's brilliant, I would, anyone listening to this, you need to read the work of Richard Lowenstein. So he, pr he published a paper in 2018, which effectively says there is no research evidence to suggest that iatrogenesis, which is the creation of something by the cause of therapy, that iatrogenesis can actually lead to dissociation. No research evidence, no clinical trials. So when people are saying, oh, you know, it, this is just therapists leading people towards having DID, I'd say, show me the clinical trial that demonstrates that that actually works, because there's a ton of research evidence to say that DID is actually a real thing. And there's no evidence to suggest that us as therapists are creating DID in people, just not there. So I always just say, brilliant, you show me the research paper that proves the iatrogenesis leads to DID in a randomized control trial, and I will have a discussion with you about that, and maybe you can change my mind. Until then, I'm certain you can't. What's the recommended treatment for DID? What, in your opinion, makes the biggest difference to progress in therapy for DID? I, I, this is a fairly simple question in a way, so I can actually be concise. There's, there's numerous sets of guidelines in the world, so whether you, the um, ISSTD, the International Society for the Study of Trauma and Dissociation, or say Blue Knot Foundation in Australia, they've produced some really excellent guidelines and it's a three-phase approach. So the first phase is stabilization, the second phase is trauma exploration, the third phase is integration. So the treatment approach for DID is you spend time getting to know that person, you look at all the stuff that's going on in their life that's causing them problems, causing them difficulties, and you try and solve those problems. You get that person to be stable and resilient and able to withstand the, the emotional hit of trauma work, before you do the trauma work. And then you have the integration phase, which is looking at how to bring the dissociation together, integrate the person both internally and externally to the world. So you try and give them reasons for getting on out there in the world. So that's what that's essentially the thing. And, and every set of guidelines works on that basis. Those are the guidelines for complex trauma. Those are the guidelines for dissociative disorders. That's what you use. The biggest single factor I think that makes a difference is that person's engagement with that. If they are willing to accept that they dissociate, they are willing to accept that they have alters and they are willing to try and understand their system and work alongside it, you motor forward in progress. The stuff that really caused the barriers is when a person doesn't believe their own internal state. They're rejecting or denying their dissociation. And yet the dissociation just continues rattling on day after day after day. And yet they're in complete denial of it. That's the thing that causes the greatest problem. The goal as a therapist is not to think that what I want from therapy is, is the right thing. It's what the person wants. And they're free to change their mind. So they might want complete system with them all the time because it's great and then decide that they actually don't want it anymore and then you work towards that integration yeah it's a weird like an ambiguous situation it's like I think years ago um I definitely would have I would have wanted everyone gone and then it kind of moved yeah. on to oh my gosh I couldn't bear the thought of anyone yes. gone because they might it's like my comfort blanket and how would I how would I live how would I function Yes. And then now as we're kind of moving through treatment, it's kind of we're like an ambiguous. It's like, well, we'll see yes. when we process. Once we process the trauma, we'll see how we feel. There's no rush to make a decision. It's their autonomy, yeah. right? Yeah, that's what it should be. There's, you know, partly the reason why dissociation occurs is that lack of power. You've got no agency. You've got no power. You've got no choice, no control. Therapy should be used to really enhance that person's agency so that they have autonomy if they walk away from therapy with no agency no autonomy no power no confidence but all their alters are gone I don't think you've done that person a great job what are the gaps for assessment and treatment I guess of dissociative disorders within the UK sometimes the gap is just there's nobody in there that's ever been trained or knows anything about dissociation so, or that they don't want to know because there's a person in that team who might lead the team, could be a psychiatrist, could be a team leader, could be a psychologist that just doesn't think that dissociation is really a thing. So therefore, anyone that says they dissociate, they change the diagnosis. It's 
borderline personality disorder or it's bipolar or it's schizophrenia or whatever and then they treat accordingly and and there's no because there's no guidelines this is the big problem we've got we're working on american guidelines and i also like looking at the australian guidelines we don't have nice guidelines the national institute for um, care and uh, health excellence that's the big problem the biggest gap in the uk is a set of nice guidelines for complex trauma and dissociation we've got them for ptsd and that's it there isn't even there so the icd in the in the icd 11 international classification of diseases which is set up by the world health organization labels complex trauma and dissociation as being a significant diagnostic category and yet the United Kingdom that uses ICD guidance for diagnostics doesn't have a set of guidelines to treat. So that's what we're working on. And that's where pressure groups come in handy. So I'm continually asking NICE to set the guidelines up. People like first person plural, pods, they're continually asking NICE to do this stuff. Eventually we will be able to do it. Do you have any self-help advice if someone can't access any professional treatment or system management tools, anything like that? I, I suppose the, the, the key is the internal organization is always the thing that I start working on first with somebody. And that's what you can do even if you don't have a therapist. You, you might have family or friends that are around or you might just be on your own. The ignoring that internal system is never going to do you any good. <clears throat> so the, the key self-help for me outside of standard anxiety relaxation type things is to be welcoming and start communicating with your internal system. Some stuff like meditation is not gonna work because that can make you feel worse because you're going inside and if you've got a chaotic internal system, things like meditation and internal mindfulness can actually make a person feel worse. So things like just having a long hot soak in the bath, that might not be a good idea at all. That might be a really terrible idea, but what you can do is just sit and talk internally and reassure. So when you're feeling rubbish and you suddenly get a really a wave of anxiety or a wave of self-hate or anger is to just stop in any given moment and do a safety reassurance check. So to be able to tell yourself there's no threat, you look around you, look at the objects in the room, look at the, 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 the space that you're in and say to yourself, nothing bad is going on in this moment. I'm having an emotional reaction to something, a trigger, but... Mm -hmm. There's no threat. There's no one here that's going to harm me. We are OK. I will look after you. I will make sure that nobody hurts us. So that level of internal reassurance offering is probably the, the, the key thing that people can do, because you can do that anywhere. You can do it silently. You can be sitting on a bus or on a train or on a plane. You could be at work. You could be in a queue at the supermarket. It doesn't matter where you are you can always do that level of self-reassurance and just say to yourself, we're okay, no, no threat. Yes, there are a lot of people. And yes, I can feel my heart beating. And yes, I'm getting scared, but nobody is hurting me. I will be okay. That's the key for me. Right? What can speakers like me and others in the DID community do to support the recognition of this disorder? Being a voice, being a voice of reason is, is so important. There are Within the medical field, and I include the sort of the psychological me mental health stuff within that, within that, the, the way that we approach health, the user experience voice is becoming more and more powerful. That voice is becoming more and more popular. There's, there's the British uh, Medical Journal now have a whole journal set designed for user experience narrative. It's, it's confidence. It's, it's to not feel ashamed of having a condition that is not your fault. To have to not blame yourself for having it just to be as open as you can do but there are risks attached to this so i don't want to say to everybody who's got did you need to start shouting it from the rooftops come on social media and start doing this because there are risks there might be risks to relationships to family to having the kids to driving a car to employment all of those sort of things you do what you feel you're able to do I do, I do a lot of research work on how we utilize services within the United Kingdom. So GP, ambulance, paramedic, uh, A&E, hospital, all those sort of services. The, the, one of the key things that a person can do is have a good relationship with their GP and try and figure out how they can help their GP support them as best as possible. GPs are really important in this process. And that's within the UK. Obviously, there are different healthcare systems out elsewhere in the world. 
but being able to link to a, a health provider who you trust and develop the relationship with them is, I think, is a good starting point. If you feel like going on social media and doing TED Talks, for example, then great, you can do that stuff, but not everyone can do that. I wouldn't want to say you've got to go and do that stuff because people who just can't might end up feeling really crap because they can't do that stuff. There isn't really a what you should be doing. It's it's do what works for you, but don't hide because hiding is where shame sits. And if a person carries shame, that's never going to go away unless you share it with somebody else. And when you share that shame with somebody else, you get the opportunity of them, that person saying, that's OK. You don't have to feel embarrassed about that. Fine. I don't mind that. Instantly, that shame starts just dropping away and reducing so yeah people people need to feel that they can do what they want but not to hide in shame because I think that's the big problem um so how long does it generally take to be diagnosed with DID and how does that happen uh well it can take years and years and years and years and years and years so from when the person starts experiencing symptoms to when they get a diagnosis you know, whether they've got anyone that's around who can diagnose them, how long they hide those that presentation for. So you could spend 10 years just sort of cracking on and doing your own thing and then going into a GP, being told, no, that's nothing, that's just a fad. And then you might disappear off for another 10 years. Or you might walk into um, a GP office in West Cheshire and the GP says, oh, OK, you're talking about dissociation. We've got this clinic now that we can open access refer to. So I'll refer you to them. They turn up on my door two weeks later and we start going through the diagnostic system. And within probably two months, they've had a full assessment and a diagnosis and could it be in treatment. There, there, there isn't a set path. I think if you're being diagnosed in half an hour, it might not be the best assessment interview. It might is. Because even if they're right, you walk into, let's say, a psychiatry office and you've got alters and they're, you're switching and all this stuff is happening and it's totally genuine. And the psychiatrist is knowledgeable and says, yes, you've got DID. That still doesn't give you an awful lot of information about that person. So in half an hour, you can't get questions in about dissociative amnesia, depersonalization, derealizations, identity alterations, identity confusion. There's just no time to do that properly takes hours. If you've got a diagnosis, so the diagnosis can be correct, but it then doesn't have a great deal of depth of information. That's my question, I suppose. So um, kind of on the self-awareness and self-diagnosis route, how, how do you feel about that kind of thing? Well, self-awareness is is being tuned into your own body and your how you feel. Now, that is a problem with a lot of people with dissociation because they don't want to tune in or they can't tune in because that's a trauma trigger. So... Mm -hmm. Trying to understand emotions or trying to connect to the body can be traumatic for some people of their own. So they might be aware that they're in pain, but they can't really channel into where that pain's coming from because that leads to um, intrusive experiences and maybe dissociative episodes. So they could be aware that something is going on, but have no clue about it. That You've got to go get help for that stuff. Other people might be, yeah, I've got these voices in my head and they come out and they talk about stuff and they behave in different ways. And sometimes I remember stuff, sometimes I don't. Therefore, I've got DID. That's self-diagnosis. We wouldn't recommend self-diagnosis for any medical or health condition. So why would we say it's OK for this? If you've been having terrible stomach pain for two weeks and then you self-diagnose yourself with IBS or bowel cancer, no GP is going to think that that's a good idea. Every doctor will say we have to investigate properly because diagnosis leads to treatment. If you self-diagnose you can then and you get it wrong, you can then start treating yourself for a condition you don't have and potentially make it worse. So I'm happy with people self-labeling and saying, I think I have DID, but to diagnose yourself is just not a good idea. So DID is like, I'm, I don't see it differently to any other health condition. It's like, you've got to be, it, it's, a, it's a proper thing that you need proper help with. And the diagnosis is the gatekeeping to that proper help. What I really don't want people to do is reading around on this stuff, think that they've got this thing and then don't tell anybody and then sit with it for years and years and years. Because that doesn't seem like a great, unless it's of no bother to you whatsoever, then why would you be doing that in the first place? 
So do all the research, but take that step towards a health professional and say, I think something is going on. I'd like you to help me figure out what it is. That, that is, to me, is the best way of dealing with it. For our final question, I'm really interested in the current research. So is there anything that particularly stands out to you in terms of DID research that you'd recommend? The, 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 I think the best research coming out at the moment, other than, other than the cost effectiveness stuff, so the research that's helped trying to help services fund treatment programs is massively important. And that's the bit that I get involved in, trying to prove that um, therapy for DID is actually cost effective. And I've, I've done that in many ways and that more and more people are jumping on that one now, which is fantastic. The other stuff, which I think is most important, is the, the looking at DID as a physical thing, because there are still people that deny the existence of DID or just believe it's just a, a fabricated or it's an emotional thing and it doesn't really have any sort of depth to it. There is research coming out. Well, it has been for ages because people like Ellet, van der, um, Ellet Nienhaus, sorry, and Onno van der Hart, They've been doing studies in the Netherlands for years under MRI scanners to demonstrate that there are physical shifts in the brain with DID. And they've been able to come up with some fantastic work on this. And there's a really brilliant article that came out last year in the British Journal of Psychiatry by Simone Reinders, which put DID and control people into MRI scans and actually looked at the brain imaging. And they found a... Uh, a difference in people with DID and people without DID in the brains that gave you about a 75% accurate chance of being able to show which was the DID brain and the non-DID brain just by looking at a slice of MRI. That to me is fantastic, not necessarily in a diagnostic sense, because people aren't going to be able to go and put themselves in, a, in an MRI scanner to have a diagnosis, but to be able to demonstrate to the wider world that DID isn't something that is purely just an emotional thing. There is a significant presence in the brain. What they're not saying is that the brain chemistry or the organic brain chemistry causes DID. What they're saying is DID has led to significant changes in the brain sequencing. The neurodevelopment of the brain has been changed as a result of early trauma. And the DID is the outward presentation of that trauma. And the fact that that was in the British Journal of Psychiatry is great because that's a peer review. That's an excellent peer reviewed journal read by psychiatrists around the world who are being able to see now that DID is being recognized on a physical level. And the, like the holy grail of mental health is to find that biological marker, the genome or the gene sequencing of a mental health condition. Now, we haven't got that in DID because it isn't going to be there. What we've got, though, is a physical demonstration of DID within brain mapping. And that means that any psychiatrist that says that DID doesn't exist can be led to that study and said, well, your colleagues think otherwise. And that's why I think the, the, the science of DID, actually understanding the consequence of trauma on the brain is the best research trail that we've got at the moment. So long as we don't then think that the, the organics of the brain cause the DID, because then that's just a medication thing and that's not going to work. So it's it's getting it the right way around. But I think, yeah, following that physical trail is going to be a, a big goal for us in this field. As well, is there a cutoff point to develop DID? I've heard some people kind of say it's between like three and a six or a six and a nine. And yeah, I'm just quite curious about when the ending okay. is. I don't think we know enough at the moment. I think the child... Uh, studies on children with complex trauma and dissociation is at a very early stage. People like Renee Marx are doing the sort of the leading work on this in terms of diagnosis and therapy. The problem we've got is that how do we really know? Because so many children that are in traumatic or in abusive circumstances are not the ones that are going into health services and being picked up for help. So the age at which a person is developing DID is likely the age at which they're undergoing the greatest level of trauma and they're going to be hidden from health services. We don't really know. I've, there is definitely a cutoff point where you could say that, let's say if you're 18 years old and you get kidnapped and tortured for a period of two years, you'll dissociate, but you're not going to develop DID. So it's the emerging pattern of the development of identity in the brain. We don't have a, a what's called a critical window for the development of our identity. So ducks 
have a critical window. So they have to imprint within a very short space of time onto an adult in order to learn how to be a duck. That doesn't exist within the human being. We don't have that cutoff point to say that our identity is completely and utterly certain by the age of, like, it's just not there because there's so many infinite probabilities for how identity can be formed. And at what point does personality stop developing? Is it 10? Is it 12? Is it 15? Is it 25? That we're not really, I don't think it's, it's almost like it's a pointless question to answer because if anyone does come up with an answer, there's always going to be someone that doesn't fit into it. I think we just have to say that DID is largely a phenomenon that is generated in childhood. Whether it goes into adolescence or not, I think it's still up for grabs. I think, again, that's a, that's a, that's a good research thing. But how do we research that in clinical trials? We definitely know that DID exists in children. And Rene Marx is the, probably the, one of the world leading therapists and um, clinicians in this field. And she works clinically with children who have DID. And she has demonstrated the DID in those kids. So it's not just an adult thing. It's an adult thing, it's a child thing, it's a teenage thing. We just have to see it as being part of human experience at this stage. Thank you ever so much for answering all of the questions today. I know I've bombarded you with hey, so many. Yes, <laughs> great, I love it. It's been really, really good. Brilliant. And, you know, I'm sure that we could have talked for hours long more. Um, but I'm curious now, I guess, about you and why you're setting up a channel yourself. So you set up the CTAC yeah. Clinic online That's on YouTube. That's right. Like yesterday. <laughs> And I've got, an, I've got a, another um, a video that is going to be loaded up today. So by the time this comes out, it will already be there. So looking yeah, at yeah. sort of the a, a, a top five best and worst things about having DID. Uh, so I'm going to I'm going to have that. I think it partly it felt like there is there is a big problem online about DID. There's a lot of argument and there's a lot of supposition. We have to encourage debate. I want to emulate some of my the people I really respect in the field and go online and try and educate, but doing it from a really practical therapeutic perspective. And I, I, I enjoy, obviously, I guess you can tell, I enjoy talking to people about my work. Um, and there's been so much interest in some of my Twitter stuff, like my reflections from therapy. People are really interested in what it is that I'm learning from the therapy room. And yeah, it felt like a really nice opportunity and a, a bit of a risk, but just to be able to offer a different conversation within the field, I guess. I'm really looking forward to it. Really excited. Me and too. of course, yes. all of your links will, for your videos and your channel will be in the description listed below. I'm recommending anyone to please check out uh, Dr. Lloyd and his uh, CTAC clinic work on YouTube. Um, and again, we'd just like to thank you ever so much for being a part of um, this oh. today for our very first Ask the Expert series. So thank you ever so much, Mike. <laughs> oh, you're more than welcome, Jess. I really, really appreciate it. And, you know, goes without saying, keep up all the excellent work you're doing out there. It's, it's, it's inspiring. Thank you. Thank you so much for watching our very, very first Ask the Experts episode. We're really looking forward to exploring the series further. We've already interviewed some people and we're lining them up to be released shortly. So please go and subscribe to Dr. Lloyd because I'm sure he's going to create some incredible content and we could all learn something from it. And don't forget, if you're curious about any of the research or information given today, there are links in the description below. Please do check them out. That's it for our very first Ask the Experts episode. We hope you guys have loved it and enjoyed it just as much as we have and I hope this will be an invaluable resource to somebody who's wanting to know the basics of DID right the way from um, discovering and assessment and treatment. Okay, thanks guys! Bye! <laughs>